Hi Clement. What is severe malaria and how is it diagnosed in tropical countries where hospitals often lack access to high-tech analytical labs? Okay, I think I'll better start by explaining what malaria is. So malaria is an infectious disease. Uh, it's caused by a parasite. The name of the parasite is Plasmodium. There are a few species, but one of them is more important than the others. That's Plasmodium falciparum. Um, we get it from infected mosquitoes that bite us. And then when the mosquito bites you, this parasite goes to your liver. Then it stays there for a week or two, and then it goes into the bloodstream. Once it is in the bloodstream, it invades new red blood cells, and that's where all the symptoms begin to occur. So the problem is that uh, the symptomatology, kind of like the signs that we see in those patients, are not very different from a patient with flu. So sometimes it's very complicated to know how severe this is. So what is severe malaria? So in some cases, these patients develop severe symptoms, so some of them go into coma, some of them become breathless, some of them become very anemic because the parasites are inside the red cells, so they destroy them. Sometimes it blocks the bone marrow, you produce no more red blood cells. So uh, the problem with that is that the mortality increases to the extent that when some of these severe malaria syndromes, as we call, they overlap, we get mortalities up to 35%, which is pretty serious for a, an infectious disease. So, in, yes, uh, answering your second question, um, this is funny because the reality is that to diagnose malaria, you don't need a lot. You just need someone who can read a malaria slide and a microscope. That's the gold standard. What's the problem? In places where malaria takes place, uh, you, need, uh, you need a microscope in place, but the problem is that you don't have an interrupted power supply you don't have very good technicians. So that the reality is that although it would be very easy in the UK to make this diagnose, in Africa it's far more complicated. So the reality is that we need to create alternative tools for that. What could we do to manage malaria diagnosis and clinical management? Okay. We can do many things because really there's a lot of room for improvement. So I think the best way to convey this is kind of like by trying to display the, an example of a scenario in Africa. So let's imagine we are in the Gambia, in a rural area, and we are at the peripheral health post. Then a mom comes with a little baby, two-year-old, sick with fever, and this is the complaint. My baby is with high fever, and he's prostrated, which just means that he cannot sit down, he cannot feed, and sometimes he's breathless. So here's a challenge for the person that will see this kid because they, they will have like 100 more kids in the line and they will have to make a decision. Is this malaria? Is this pneumonia? What treatment should I give? The problem is if this occurs, let's say, in the, during the malaria season, what you see is that kind of like people tend to overdiagnose malaria and they say, okay, this is probably malaria and probably it is and we'll give them anti-malarials, we'll send them home. But the problem is if you get it, ra if you get it wrong, the problem is that this kid may die when he, he goes home because sometimes you need to play it safe and sometimes if it is a bacterial infection or, 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 or it is malaria, you don't know. You need to give anti malaria you need to give uh, antibiotics. The reality is this is suboptimal. So the thing is there's an information gap. We try to develop tools to bridge this gap to some extent. So yes, there's a lot of uh, room for improvement. <laughs> what are the most important lines of research that have been developed in the last five to ten years in this area? Well, in relation to this, perhaps it's better if I explain what I have been doing that led me to do this. And I think that when I first started uh, working malaria, I was addressing very, very specific questions. So the first interest I had was kind of like to understand how, what happens in children with severe malaria and severe anemia and just trying to work out what were the mechanisms. That always leads you to kind of like one, two molecules, and with these molecules you try to explain a lot of things. Uh, the reality is that the more I've been doing this, the more I realize that I don't see the big picture. So uh, what I'm trying to do now with my research is actually, rather than zooming in and focusing on a single molecule, just to zoom out and look for patterns. And hoping that in these patterns I will understand better the disease, how this develops, and also kind of like identify markers that can be useful clinically. Could your research produce a simple kit that could be used anywhere in the world? I guess you're right. Um, you, you, you want to develop something that, like a pregnancy test. You want kind of like to develop a kit that uh, you get this sick kit, you get a drop of blood, you put it in the kit, you get a positive cross, and then it says to this person that works in the in, in that environment, say, okay, this 
this boy will have or this girl that is sick will have to go to hospital. This can receive treatment, go home. So kind of like this is the long-term vision. Um, my research now would be more actually looking for these molecules. So if we come up with good candidates, good molecules that make sense, the next step is to do what we call um, prospective clinical validation. Reality means that you just need to design a specific uh, piece of research to see how your markers that you have identified actually perform in real life. It's nothing more than that. And once you get there, the, <laughs> the important thing is just to develop partnership with the industry and with them actually develop this simple kit that will be used in practical terms. Why do you feel your research is, is important? Why should we put money into your research? Yeah. It's very relevant. It is an important health problem. I give you... Um, important figures, relevant figures for malaria. So let's say we see like nearly 250 million cases of malaria per year and nearly a million deaths. Most of these deaths occur, let's say, in children in sub-Saharan Africa under the age of five. So it's, it's a massive public health problem. Um, another question is um, what the health economics say. The thing is, in this cycle of... Um, poverty and disease, it's also very important to see that the impact of malaria. And some people have modeled that if you could eliminate malaria from a specific country or particular country, um, you would increase the GDP by 30%. So the impact seems to be pretty striking. Another question is, why should the UK or an organization here be um, bothered about this? I, th I think this doesn't need an answer. Lots of the research councils in the UK um, it's, it's part of the strategy to actually invest in um, poverty and kind of like uh, developing countries and health inequalities. So this is kind of like pretty much in the agenda. And finally, how do you feel that your research fits into translational medicine within this department? I think it fits very, very nicely. Um, it fits very nicely because there's a lot of people, very good scientists uh, working in global health. For me, it's kind of like a fantastic opportunity to collaborate with some of them so we know the NDM cares about this and from the translational point of view I think uh, I mean you cannot get more translational than that we are looking for tools that improve health we're looking for markers that can help in the decision-making process to actually uh, improve the management of these patients so from that point of view that's very translational I would say thank you very much You're welcome